is uh, something that is very paradigm shifting. And uh, because it's, it might be, I don't know what your background is, but it might be so different than the way you think, you might have a difficult time with it. And uh, what I'm about to share is not difficult, uh, but it might be different. And our minds can often, when we hear something different, to kind of kick it out, resist it. So the first thing I just want to share with you is uh, um, don't accept what I'm saying. Like, don't come here thinking that I'm trying to convince you of a new way of thinking. Just kind of just listen to it. Right? You can judge the rest of your life whether this makes sense. But today I just want to focus on making sense out of it. And then whether it's something that's acceptable to you, uh, applicable to you, but you can have your whole life. But I find that very often when uh, I teach anyway, it's probably every, anybody teaches, uh, that people are both trying to understand it and judge it and figure out whether they're going to accept it or not. Right? I didn't even call that way. Sorry. I woke up a bit of a call. I don't want to make it worse. Thank you so much. Sorry. Um, so, um, so just listen. I mean, you can ask questions. Right? But, but, but right now, just listen to the ideas and try to understand them and don't try to figure out whether you want to accept them or not. You can figure that out the rest of your life, okay? So what's so, uh, so critical about what I'm going to share uh, is uh, it's a very different way of looking at things, okay? And when this idea was made known to me, it was like a, like a real wow. Because, you know, science has been trying to understand the universe. But science has been applying our logic to the universe. And what science is beginning to realize is that maybe the universe doesn't follow our logic. In other words, we're applying a way of thinking, and we think that surely the universe should apply to the rules of our logic. Well, what they're realizing is that the universe is not applying, is not following our rules of logic. And therefore, is it possible that reality has a different logic? And that we have to attune our logic to its logic rather than force it into our logic. Okay? So it's kind of like, um, you know, uh, where the, the hard drive is not reading, uh, you know, the, the software. There's, something's wrong with the hard drive. So we are hardwired to think in a certain way, which is not really the original way Torah thought. And because we think in this particular way, which we're going to call classical logic, we pick up the Torah and we want it to make sense to our classical logical minds. But what we're going to discover today is that really at the root of Judaism was a very different kind of logic, which is called paradoxical logic. Mm -hmm. Now, paradoxical logic is not unique to the Jewish people. Uh, it, you can find it, you can Google paradoxical logic, and you will find that Eastern traditions uh, are very much aligned with paradoxical logic. I think the surprise, I know for me, and maybe for other Jews, is that that is actually uh, it's, uh, true to Judaism, that we are actually paradoxical logical people. Okay? With that as a little introduction, let's look at some sources. So uh, I call this Hegyon Kodesh. I mean, Rav Cook. I took it from Rav Cook. But holy logic. Holy logic is very different than the normative logic that we know. Um, so it says in the Gemara, Amar. I'm sorry, the yellow is missing there. Amar Rabbi Abba Amar Shmuel. Shalosh Shanim Nechluku Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. Three years Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel argued. These said that the law was like them. And the other one said, the halach is like us. A divine voice came out of the sky and said, These and those are the living words of God. And the law is according to Beit Hillel. But wait a second. If these and those are the living words of God, So what is it about Hillel that he merited that the halacha should be according to him? Because they were very easygoing. 
Va'aluvim, and they were uh, not easily uh, insulted. V'shonim divrehem, and they would, v'divrei uh, Beit Shammai, they would teach their words, and they would teach the words of those that argued with them. Oh, not only that, mm. they would, before they would teach something, they would first say, listen, this is an opinion we don't agree with, but this is the opinion of Shammai. This is our opinion. Okay? So this Gemara you know, has a, a number of problems in it. right? Maybe you could uh, share some of the problems you see in this Gemara. What seems odd about this piece? Mm -hmm. What's your name? Sarlaya. Sarlaya. Uh, it doesn't make sense that someone should win a judicial argument based on their attitude. Right. Not only their attitude, but their midot. Yeah, like that's nice, but that's not right. How we you don't. We that. don't pass in according to people being nicer. <laughs> right. So that already uh, uh, excellent questions earlier. That already makes us wonder. What else? Yeah. Seems like. Tell everybody your name. Everybody know your name? Um, I'm Lizzie. Right. Um, Where are you from? It seems like there's like a, a, an objective truth that we're striving for when we're trying to pass in Malacca, especially Beit Halakha and Shammai, like the two premier debaters of what Halakha is going to be, and how can they both be able to live together? That's right. We, we the, the very concept that both could be right is uh, very disturbing because it sounds very rel relative. It's like, you can have your opinion, you can have your opinion. Everybody's a right. Everybody tolerates. Everybody has a right to their opinion. But even though everybody has a right to opinion, he's a nicer guy. Right? So we're going to, the whole lot is going to be like him. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Good. What else? Yeah, what's your name? Julian. Julian. Um, uh, the fact that they're disagreeing about something, but they're both right, is that those two things seem to be like conflicting, but yeah. It doesn't seem possible that two could be right. Yeah, excellent. What else? Any other thoughts? That's problematic. All right. All right. I think you, you, you got that. All right. Also, I mean, the fact that Hashem is kind of um, mixing in with this batko, saying, you know, they're both right. And also, we're going to have to clarify, what does it mean? It didn't say they were both right. What did it say? These, these, the, these and the, these are the living words of God. The living words of God. These are the living words of Hillel and Shammai. Right? So what, what does that mean, living words of God? Because it didn't say they're both right. It said these are the living... It could have also said these are the words of God. What is the living words of God? Yeah, follow that? Okay, good. So let's look at the Ritva. What does he say there? They asked the rabbis in France, How's it possible that they could both be the living words of God? And this one is saying that it's forbidden, this one is saying it's permissible. I mean, they're just totally the opposite. Right? And this is what they said. When Moses ascended above the Kabbalah of the Torah to get the Torah, Erelo al kol devar, with devar mem tet panim lixur, mem tet panim later. When Moshe Rabbeinu went to Shemayim, he was shown 49 reasons that something is forbidden and 49 reasons why something is permissible. Oh boy. Right? So in the Olama Emmets, in the world of truth, somehow, both are right, right? That he was shown that this particular situation has 49 reasons to be usher and 49 reasons not to be usher. V'sha'al HaKadosh Baruch Hu Zeh. And he asked the Kodesh Baruch Hu, what am I supposed to do with this? V'amar she'yezeh masur l'chaf me'israel. They'll have to deal with it. <laughs> the, the rabbis, this is in their hands, what to do with this. Right? She'bechol dor v'dor in every generation, v'yach rakamotem. And, and they'll decide. They'll, 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 they'll determine. That, that already is bringing to, 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 to question, so what is the absolute meaning of Torah? What is emes? Right? I think we always thought that emes is this and not that. Right? But suddenly we have an, an emes that is this and that, and they're mutually exclusive. 
And the rabbis have been given this incredible responsibility that they'll determine this in this world. And what are they determining? If, if, if it's really, you know, both correct, so then what's there to determine? Why, why is there anything to determine here? Maybe, maybe it just should be that kind of confusion. So what is this world meant to be in contrast to this higher world of emes that the both are true? But Nachonu lefi adrashu b'derach emet yesh tamasod b'dvar. He said, "This is this is the drasha, but there's actually a deeper secret going on here, which he doesn't share." <laughs> so, <clears throat> let's look at number three. Kol machloket shei l'shem shemaim. Any machloket which is for the for the sake of heaven, sofa litkayem. That machloket will be established and sustained. It will be sustainable. But when people argue not for the sake of heaven, there's some kind of ego thing going on here. There's some kind of personal interest driving them. Right? Then such a machlokas will not be sustained. Right? It will not last. So give us an example of a machlokas that was truly an altruistic machlokas. Zu machlok is Hillel v'shama. This is machlok. You don't want a source sheet? Okay. Zu uh, zu machlok is Hillel v'shama. This is the machlok is of Hillel and Shammai. She'ein el Hashem shemayim. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I read that wrong. There should be a comment there. So what is the Hashem shemayim? What is a forsake of heaven kind of machlok? It's a Shammai and Hillel. What's a non, you know, altruistic... Um, machlokas, that's the machlokas of Korach and his, his congregation that argued against Moshe Rabbeinu's position and Aaron's position. Something's very wrong with this at first reading. Something very wrong with this mission. Julian. Depending on whether the intents of people are, tr are good or not, the, like the, the meaning of the, like what, what happens in a disagreement is changed. Well, why does that bother you? I mean, because, it's just telling you that because people, because people are colored, when people have personal interests, it colors their proper thinking. When a person is completely the shame shemayim, it's all about for the sake of God, for the sake of truth, then they will not be colored for personal interests. Why does that bother you? Because theoretically, if something's logically, like if, they're, if it's logically, if both are logically sound, then it, um, and they wouldn't otherwise be able to find an agreement, why would they be able to find an agreement just because they don't totally think it? Like, logically, if they're both sound, they'll be able to... Uh, actually, I don't see it that way, I'll tell you why. Because we don't think logically when there's personal interests at stake. That's called shulcha. You know, when you have a judge that has been given some form of bribery, he doesn't think straight. And so, too, when our ego bribes us for kavod, uh, for honor, we don't think straight. That's why a lot of people don't think straight, because we are so under the influence of the desire for honor and acknowledgement. We so much want to be right, we could so easily bend our, our logic could be so, so off. And we think we're on. That's what's so scary about it. Um, that's what's really great about, you know, when you're in, you know, Midrasha or Yeshiva, and you're both looking at a piece of text, there's an incredible exercise of humility going on here. Because I'm going to say what I think it means, and you're going to say what you think it means, and then there's a little voice inside me that says, you, you're stupid. You know, they're right, but you can't let them know you're right. I mean, like, you know, really stupid. So you keep arguing your point, you start realizing that, you know, that I'm, I'm wrong. Right? You see, that's where you get stuck. You're never wrong. You could never be wrong. Your thinking was wrong. You are a soul. Souls are never wrong, right? They could just adopt the wrong thinking. So if somebody shows you you're thinking wrong, you'll be thank you'll be thankful. You'll be so thankful that, oh, I don't have to think wrong anymore. Right? But when we start getting so identified and so personally invested in our thinking, then we've lost sense of our true identity, which is to be a soul in service of a chef. Right? Any other problems here? Yes, Sarah Leah. Um why is it a good thing that this machlokes sofolit kayem? What does that okay, mean? Okay, what does it actually mean that a machlokes sofolit kayem? Anybody want, or not mit kayem? Anyone want to take a shot at what that means? It will survive for the ages. Yeah, like why is it that It will good? survive. This machlokes will never be resolved. Why is that good? 
Why is that? that well, that's, well, actually, you, uh, I think you're saying the question, but I would say it in a simpler way. Mm -hmm. So let's see if somebody else can get the question. I think you get it, but, but, uh, but there's a simpler way to, to kind of present it. Mm -hmm. This seems backwards. Yeah. If people are the same Shemayim, and there's no vested interest in their argument, they are really all for the truth, then you would think that this Machloket would not be survive, would not survive. This Machloket would be resolved, right? But it's saying that people who argue with Shem Shemayim, right, for truth's sake, that Machlokis will never be resolved. But people that don't argue for truth's sake, it's really ego's sake, that Machlokis will be resolved. I would have thought the other way around. When people are stuck in their egos, they'll never resolve the machlokas. And I would think that people are really l'shem shemayim, then that machlokas would be resolved. But we know the answer. It was in the first, it was in the, 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 the source previously. That's why I put it in. Right? Mm -hmm. oh, what, what, what is the Ritba telling us? Right? What is he telling us? Yeah, what's your name? Andrew. Yeah. I guess getting closer to God or truth or like, like objective truth actually means that there's Ah, uh, objective truth is paradoxical. If you're really L'shem Shemayim, someone's going to see that it's heads, and someone's going to say it's tails, and they're going to realize it's a coin. And it was beyond the either or of heads or tails. There was a third option that our minds can't wrap around right now. Because we are dualistic thinkers, we're looking at a non-dual truth with dual eyes. And you're seeing one side of it, I'm seeing the other side of it, and we need to know that there are two sides to one point. There are two sides to one. So therefore, if you really change Shemayim, you will always find two sides. Just like it said before, in Shemayim, when Moshe Rabbeinu went up there, every case had 30, uh, 39 uh, supports or, 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 or reasons for it to be true, I mean usur, and 39 that it's mutter. <coughs> and that's the way reality really is. Now this was very difficult for science to realize. You know, mm -hmm. when they did an experiment with light, they set up light, they set up an experiment, and they always thought that light was a particle. But then they set up a, an experiment where they were able to demonstrate that light functions as a wave. Now, a wave and a particle are mutually exclusive. So they went back to the original experiment, and sure enough, the light is acting like a particle. And then they started to realize, well, is light a particle, or is light a wave? Yes. And the answer is, it's beyond the either or. Maybe it's a wavicle. Right? But our minds, which are dualistic, are distilling a one truth into two facets. And we need to realize that our mode of viewing is skewed. And so science for so long was trying to fit reality into our way of thinking rather than fitting our way of thinking into reality. And realize that maybe there's a different logic that the universe functions in according to. Right? And, um, and the truth is that that is the secret of love. Because love is completely illogical. Completely illogical. You know? And uh, there's a, a comedian by the name of Henny Youngman who says, Look, I think marriage is a fine institution. Why would I want to put myself into an institution for the rest of my life? <laughs> right? You gotta be crazy! Totally nuts! Right. It's crazy. Right. But that's it. The mystery of a marriage is we are one, and yet I'm not you, you're not me. Well, how can that be? If I'm not you, you're not me, then we can't be one. Right. If we're one, then we're one of the same. Love transcends classical logic. Right. I'm my wife, and yet I'm not my wife at the same time. Crazy thing. And that was Adam Arisham. The first human being was not male or female. He was beyond the either or. 
or I said, I'm sorry, say he, right? Now they call it, uh, what do you call it, then or something? They, they. They say they? No, there's Z, another Z, word Z, I saw. Z, Z, Z. 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 <laughs> right, they had an issue with gender, you know, um, bathrooms. <laughs> all those bathrooms that they're making that are no longer gender, it's all because of Adam Marisha. He had nowhere to go for all these years. <laughs> so, Z. Okay. You know what? Z sounds like he, though. I'm sorry, they, they got the wrong word. I don't, I don't think Z's fair either. Anyways, in the meantime, um, so when people have personal interest, it'll be shown that one of them's wrong. Eventually, it'll be shown that one of them's wrong. Because there wasn't MS, there wasn't a search for MS here. But when people truly search MS, then if you cannot find other sides to the argument that are relevant and legitimate, then something's wrong. Mm -hmm. There will always be two sides to the coin. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you feel that only the right could be right, and the left is absolutely, completely ridiculous, unfounded, has no place in this world. You can't be right if there's no lefties. You need all those lefties to stay right, right? If there are no lefties in the world, there wouldn't be any rights, right? So we need to understand that there will always be another side to the coin. But the question is, but what do we do halachically? And why was the halacha according to Hillel? Because he's a nicer guy? No. It was because he was a more non-dual thinker. Mm -hmm. He was a more of a paradoxical thinker. Where do we see that in the Gemara? Mm -hmm. Exactly. He would first say, right, his opponent's position. Because he realized that I don't have a position without him. I can't be heads without tail. <coughs> there is no head without tail. We're, we're describing a coin. Right? Now the question is, so, but, so what do we do here? The idea is we've all been hardwired to see one side of the coin. That's our job. Right? And you think that you were so clever that you left the left and you became a righty. It's just your personality. Right? It's just the kind of person that Hashem brought you to the world because Hashem needed you to support that side of the coin. And Hashem needed them to support that side of the coin. And as we argue it out, hopefully we're going to get to this kind of oscillation, which is really what sound is. Sound is beyond either or. A guitar string is oscillating between two extremes. That's what's creating the sound. Okay? Truth is a vibration. Right? And it's emerging out of these two opposites. Okay? So, what, so right now, because Hillel is a little bit more non-dualistic, a little bit more paradoxically thinking, more, a little bit more paradoxically logical than Shammai, so the halakha will be like him, right? And he was easygoing, and he was, and he was not so easily uh, uh, um, offended, because he knew that there's valid validity to the other side, mm -hmm. right? And he understood that people have to vehemently argue their position because it is a genuine side of the coin. So it didn't bother him, right? As it shouldn't bother us, right? As well as it shouldn't get us to, uh, to uh, compromise our position. This is our position. We believe this is the side of the coin that has to be uh, lived right now. <laughs> Although we know that there's another side of the coin, and maybe that will be another time, which will there be another time? We'll go according to Shammai in the future. But right now, also <coughs> practically, we're in a dualistic world, right? These two sides of the coin, which is from a Kabbalistic point of view, we're in a world called Tzimtzum, a world where the truth of non-duality, of, of pure oneness, of genuine oneness, has been um, diminished from us. It's hidden from us. So, you know, black can't be operating at the same time as white. Up cannot be at the same time as down. So essentially what Judaism is, is it, look at number four. So you can learn this piece of uh, the, uh, uh, the Maharal on your own. But he basically points out that um, the Batkul did not nullify this Mahlokas. The Batkul said these and those are the living words of God. God is speaking through them. Okay? 
And, and when God speaks to this one, just like, you know, when we set up the experiment this way, light appears as a particle. When we set up the experiment that way, light appears as a wave. So when we set up the approach to truth from a Shkila point of view, this is the living Word of God. Right? This is the Word of God. And when we go on the other side, this is the Word of God. But what is the Word of God? It's beyond both. We can't even say it's both, because both sounds like it's a combination. It's not even a combination. A coin is not a combination of heads and tails. It wasn't made of heads and tails. Heads and tails didn't come first, and then it was composed of and comprised of, and we built a coin out of the heads and the tails. Heads and tails emerged out of a coin. Okay. So that's the higher meaning of true one. As it says in the Sefer Yitzirah, before the number one, what do you count, such as the divine? Hashem is a one before the number one. See, one is the opposite of two. But the one before the number one includes one and two and three and four and still stays one. Mm -hmm. Can't figure it out. It's not something that our, the logic that we have right now can deal with. So look at the bold. Lo haya batko mevatel machlokis. The batko is not trying to in any way diminish or nullify this machlokis. Because the Batko doesn't like Machlok, it's not true. Ki ahu, ve ahu haya Machlokis adeh. Hashem really, really loved this Machlok. Hashem loves Machlok. Very different way of thinking, no? Right. That's why I think it's so amazing about Judaism. You go into Beit Midrash and people are arguing. You know, imagine some guy comes from the East. And he's been meditating on a mountain for years. <laughs> And he has reached transcendence. Comes to Israel. He's a Jewish guy, of course, because, you know. Because you know. <laughs> Israel says, what does Judaism have to offer me? Uh, I know such a story, Mamash. Right? A guy, a Jewish guy, came from the East. He embraced Eastern tradition, meditating and, and levitating. And, <laughs> not what he was doing. And he comes to Israel and he, he talks to a friend of mine who's a capitalist. And he says, I want to know what Judaism has to offer me. So he says, I'm going to take you one of the biggest Kabbalists in the country, Rav Getzif Ben who is the uh, chief, who is the chief rabbi of the Kotel. He, he, he would sit in the inner inner uh, um, tunnels of the Kotel all night long doing Yehudi, you know, Kabbalistic unification meditations. <coughs> so he brings them to Rav Getz. He says, listen, Rabbi, I want you to know, I just came from the East, and I've seen some of the biggest yogis and gurus, and I've seen people lie on a bed of nails. I've seen yogis point to a bird and it dies. I've seen yogis walk through a wall, literally walk through a wall. What does Judaism have to offer me? And Rav Getz, one of the great capitalists of the Jewish people, said, all we have is love you, all we have is love. <laughs> What good is walking through walls if you got nobody to walk it through with anyways? You know what I mean? Like my, I was teaching a class in town, and one of my students came and was very excited. He had just spent a weekend with this Swami Gujigami guy, I don't know who he was, who came from the East and he did this weekend of meditation with, with Israelis, right? And, um, and he did this walking meditation. He said, I'd never met anybody in my life that had such tranquility. He says this to me. My wife's standing next to me when he says that. So my wife turns and says, is he married? <laughs> <laughs> so he says, no, actually he's not. They don't get married. <laughs> 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 Easy to stay tranquil. I uh, could be tranquil also. <laughs> you know? But married to this guy, you know, it's not, you know. Walk through walls. Point to birds. On a bed of nails. Share your bed with another person and transcend the paradox of true love. So, Hashem loves Machlokis because when you are truly on a search for truth, you'll realize there is another side to the coin. There is another side to the coin. Now, that doesn't mean that you become tolerant and you just say, well, he's okay, I'm okay. No. Your job is to present and fight for this side of the coin. Their job is to present and fight for that side of the coin. Right? We will have to halakhically decide right now. But even when we halakhically decide, that doesn't mean that we have um, 
uh, invalidated the other position. It's just right now that can't be the position. No? Right now that can't be the position. Practically, it can't. Yeah. Can you give like a 30 second breakdown on why we have to halakhically decide? Yes, because you'd have, you'd, you'd have total chaos. You have to have a people. You have to have a people where everybody, look, there is, there is still machlokis. You will have certain socks. This guy says, uh, okay, this is a small one. This guy says, Bere Priya Deman chocolate. Do you know that there's some post scheme that say that you should say Bere Priya Deman chocolate? Right? Uh, and some say, no. Okay, so the machlok. We can live with that machlokis, you know? Right? But I'll say, oh, man, if you say Bere Priya Deman on chocolate, I'm okay with that. You know what I mean? Uh, but there's other major major machlokas that, 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 that it, practically it would it would destroy the very unity of our people. So um, right now we got to go with one side of the coin in general. Although there's still machlokas and there's different there is validity to different psaq, but there's certain central halachic uh, questions that have to kind of come to some position on. Yeah. If both are logically coherent, how can someone make a rule? Mm-hmm. According to what? Like, like, like it's, 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 here it seems to be... The According to right now, what's most practical. Mm. Really? Yes. It's what's most practical. They are both from the side of Emmis. They're both true. But practically, what are we supposed to do now? How does one thing work out if, if both are well, true? Well, a majority. I mean, we have a thing. If a majority says this, then it's Mina Shemayim that Hashem is putting that perspective into the majority's head. And saying that practically that's the way we should go, but you shouldn't know there's still another side to things. All right? But let's look at what Aristotle said. Because this is a completely different way of thinking than Aristotle. And because Aristotle's way of thinking had so seeped into the very fiber of our thinking, this way of thinking seems to us ridiculous. That's how much Aristotle's way of thinking has influenced Western society, not Eastern society. And, um, so this is his, what they call the three classic laws of thought. He had something called the law of identity, which is A is A. Okay, brilliant. The law of contradiction, A is not non-A. Okay, I get that. But you understand, this is Aristotle. He's one of the greatest thinkers in all of time. He's telling us how one truly thinks. And, and because it so influenced us, right, so then that's obvious to us. Like we think, bro. Oh, What's the big Kiddush over here? That's the whole point. In his time, it was a Kiddush. Right? For us, it's obvious. Like, for sure we would think this way. And then the law of excluded middle, right? which is A cannot be A and non-A. Neither A or non-A. And that's where we disagree. Right? He's saying that A cannot be A and non-A. Well, what we're going to see that actually A is always also not A. Logically. Even though our minds kind of kick that out. Let's read over here um, just something that I wrote up to further explain that. Actually, we'll read what Aristotle says. It is impossible for the same thing at the same time to belong and not to belong to the same thing in the same respect. <laughs> this, then, is the most certain of all principles. Certain. Right? Certainly, obviously, you know, you can't belong and not belong at the same time, all right? In other words, for any proposition, either that proposition is true or its negation is true. Uh, when there are two contradictory positions where one proposition is the negation of the other, one must be true, the other must be false. Mm -hmm. It is impossible that there should be anything between the two parts of a contradiction. That's basically his point. But our point is this, Hegyon Kodesh, holy uh, logic, uh, states that A is A and not A. Opposites do not exclude each other, rather they arise simultaneously. And that is what the Maharal says on number 9. The Maharal says, Bekol shafachim yoter rechokim zeh mizeh, the more opposites are to the opposite extremes, the more they emerge out of each other. Right? And that's why they represent the all. In that which that one is that extreme, 
Vashenu HaKetzeh Hashemi, and that one is the other extreme. In other words, extremes, right? Just like in this case, you have this extreme, this side of the cup, which is open, and you have this side of the cup that's closed. But it's really one, right? They're not a machlokis, right? They, 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 they're, 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 they're representing a one truth. Well, is the cup open or is the cup closed? The answer is yes. yes. <laughs> it's a cup, right? And the opposites are emerging out of each other. Okay. Like a magnet, you've got the negative side and the positive side, but the magnet is one entity and they're both emerging out of each other. Okay? So for that reason, I want to look at the pictures on the bottom here. Right? We'll look at the one in the middle. I wish we got that logo before they did. Because uh, it's a great logo. What is actually the East representing here? It's showing you that the black is emerging out of the white. Right, see how it kind of emerges out of the white? Mm -hmm. And then the white is emerging out of the black. And then there's a white dot in the black. And there's a black dot in the white. This is a symbol of non-duality. Okay, why? Because when you think about it, you can't have black without white. You just can't. The very concept of black necessarily includes white. So that means that black, in some way, its very identity includes white. So that means black is black and not black at the same time. Because without the not black, black couldn't be black. You should hear this on poor, it makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Do you get that? Yeah. You can't have black without white. Now our minds are, what are you talking about? I'm uh, black. Th that would not be black if you never saw white. So black, by definition, includes white. White is an inherent part of black. Right? And that's what he's doing. That's what they're doing here. They're putting white in the black. And the black is emerging out of the white because you couldn't have black without white, so black is emerging out of the white. But you couldn't have white without black. So the white is emerging out of the black. And they include each other. And so this is total oneness. Okay? Here's another example of such an idea, a little bit of paradoxical logic. Uh, how many people here see an old woman? How many people here see a young woman? Put up your hands. Wow. Oh my gosh, we have to work on this. <laughs> right, you know, how many people do not see a, an old woman? Do not see? Yeah. Okay. So here's the old woman. This is her haggity nose. Here is her mouth. She's got this chin, this like really extruding, e e extending chin, right? And she, and this is a perfect profile of her, right? You see it? And what seems to be a nose of the um, the old of the young woman is actually her eyes. Ah, so when you get that, oh wow, that'll be Olam Haba. That's exactly an Olam Haba moment. You thought that this was Olam Hazan, and you'll realize, oh my gosh, this was also Olam Abba. Right? And you'll realize that Olam Hazan and Olam Abba were two sides of one coin, which is the Olam Abba of Olam Abba. Okay? So, again, that's it. But your brain can't handle this. Okay? So, you'll either see the old woman or the young woman. You will not be able to see them both at the same time. Your mind will go back and forth very quickly, but to see them both at the same time, your mind is wired to not accept contradictions. Right? That's because what Kabbalah calls the tzimtzum, that we are not what's called functioning with a quantum mind. Today they call it quantum logic and a quantum mind. Okay? So our minds have been wired to be classically logical, whereby opposites are separate and independent, but it's not true. It's not true. So look at what Rav Cook says over here at the top, number seven, six. Don't get freaked out. I don't even think Rav Cook actually would say freaked out, but don't get scared by gathering together great opposites. Mm -hmm. As it's popularly see 
commonly perceive is that you, you can't put these together. <laughs> because that which appears to the masses as as separated and opposites, who rock me pnei katnut sichlam b'tzimtzum hashkafet. It's only because they're so small-minded and because their viewing has been diminished. Tzimtzum. She'enam ro'im ki'im chelak ketan. They're only seeing a little bit of the picture. Ma'od. She'el hashleimu del yunan. They're only seeing a little bit of the higher shleimu, wholeness. And even the little part of the shlemus that you're seeing has been uh, distorted. But people who have clear thinking, their minds can extend to different places. And and they, they're very expansive. They find uh, the good. They grasp the good in everything. And they unite everything into a total oneness. Okay, so that's what we're working towards, which is really a way of thinking with the logic of love, the e-logic of love, the higher logic of love. Rabbi, I'm not you, you're not me, and yet... We are absolutely one. And head says to tails, you know, I can't live without you, but I can't be you. And if I try to be you, that will be that will be bad for both of us. And heads was that heads talking or tails? <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, and head says to tail, you know what? I love you so much, but we can't be together if you compromise who you are. You got to be yourself. I don't want you to be. Heads. I need you to be tails. Uh, because I'm heads because you're tails. And you're tails because I'm heads. Uh, that is the true way of thinking. That's why human beings are yearning for love. Because they're yearning for a different kind of logic. Uh, that transcends the classical logic that tries and creates this either or. But this is beyond the either or. Okay? Now this would be referred to as Chachma. Chachma is beyond either or. Bina is classical logic. Bina is more benzelize, between this one and that one. Okay? And of course, you're supposed to unite the two, whereby I can see that heads is not tails, and tails is not heads. That's Bina telling me that, and Chachma says, but they're one. Look at um, what is da? Those are das is uniting them. No, no, chachma is telling you. It, it, it's bina has the advantage of clarifying the distinctions. This is heads. This is tails. But at the expense of thinking that they're separate. Chachma says, no, they're united. When we bring them together, right, we have a, 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 a I call it oneity, because I don't want to, unity sounds like they were separate, we put them together. They were never separate. Right? I call it oneity, which uh, gives birth to two sides of one coin that in its deepest essence <coughs> is really one. Right? Really, really one. And that is what, that is the direction we're going in terms of the consciousness and the evolution of the, of the universe. We're going towards a non-dual mind, a quantum mind, which will be a world of uh, true love, where we will encourage each other to be different so that we can be ourselves. Mm -hmm. And not only are we not threatened by their difference, we need them to be different. Because black can't be black without white. So when black says, you know what, I, I, all these whiteies, got to get rid of them. Right? Bad. Right? They're cramping our style. It's got to be black. Right? Okay, well as soon as you get rid of all the whiteies, black goes away too. Right? So you got all these people that are, they don't understand. Um, yep. Let's look at uh, Rabbi Nachman. 
Number 10. Rak Yisrael al yedei emuna ovrim al kol hachmot. Yisrael transcends through emuna. Now emuna, most people think emuna is faith, meaning I can't really make any sense out of this. I don't really have a sound logical position here, uh, so I just believe it. No, that's not emuna, that's shtiot. That is not Judaism. Uh, Judaism says that Amuna is absolute certainty. But it's a certainty that transcends classical logic. Okay. So that's what Rav Kook is saying, I mean, sorry, Rav, Rav Nachman is saying, that Amuna ovrim al ha chokhmah. Not that Amuna violates chokhmah. It's just beyond chokhmah. It's something that you can know. And he's not using the word chokhmah the way I, I used it. Right? He's just using chokhmah in terms of wisdom. Okay? Okay? We understand Hashem, but without Chakira. Now, what does that mean without Chakira? Again, he's not saying that we're just blind faith and we're not going to think. He's saying that we bypass a lower way of knowing, which is this kind of classical analysis, to a more direct encounter with the MS. That's what he's saying. V'rat be'emunah shleima with complete emuna ki Hashem yitbrach mimale ko almim v'sovev ko almim. Because of pure emuna, we're able to believe, or actually we're able to to commit ourselves to this way of thinking that Hashem, while surrounding the world, being transcendent of it all, mimale ko almim, He fills all the world. So the question is, is Hashem transcendent, or is it tra Hashem imminent? Does Hashem transcend time, space, and all beings, or is Hashem imminent within all time, space, and all beings? What is the answer to that question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's the answer. It's Yechud Kutchebrichu Vishkinte. To unite Kutchebrichu Vishkinte means that I am uniting, not like just simply visualizing a bunch of different holy names and, you know, playing games with my head, right? But I realize that transcendence includes imminence. And imminence includes transcendence. So is Hashem transcendent or imminent? The answer is there's a third word we don't have. Mm -hmm. right? It's a third word we don't have. Right? We don't know that word. Because words, by definition, are dualistic. As soon as you say it's a this, you're saying it's not a that. Kadosh. So Kadosh is really the transcendent. Kadosh, bottom line, is the ultimate truth. But there's lower Kadosh and higher Kadosh. Just like you have Adam, and then you have Adam and Chava. Mm -hmm. okay? But the real Adam, which was capital Adam, included both. Mm -hmm. okay? And then they were split. You know? mm -hmm. And now you have little Adam, you know, lowercase Adam, and lowercase Chava. But they're really two sides of the one coin, which is capital Adam, okay? It was beyond the either or. So Kadosh, sometimes you have the word Kadosh being used in a dualistic way, and it's the opposite of Chol, right? But then you have Kadosh, you know, uppercase Kadosh, which includes Chol. That's why I look at number seven. Yesh olam shel Chol olam shel Kodesh. There's a world of Chol and a world of Kodesh. Olamim shel Chol va Olamim shel Kodesh. Worlds of Chol and worlds of Kodesh. Ha Olamim sotrim zedzeh. They contradict each other. They are mutually exclusive. Kamuvan astira hi subjektivi. Clearly, the, um, i, the, this contradiction is Russian. It's uh, <laughs> Soviet. No. Uh, it's subjectivity. It's subjective. Okay? And a human being with their mitzumtzum mind, using the Kabbalistic term in simtzum, that the way Hashem created the world of multiplicity and, and diversity is causing its simtzum in consciousness, right? Which allows the birth of all these apparent separate and stirot and, you know, chol and kodesh. Mankind with their mitzumtzam, their diminished minds, they, they, don't, they can't navigate. They cannot negotiate. They cannot bring peace to these concepts. 
They cannot bring peace to this concept. But they are at peace with each other. Mm -hmm. Right? In the higher place. When you go to Machon Kodesh HaKodeshim, which is the name of my new school. Machon Kodesh HaKodeshim. <laughs> right? Because Kodesh Kodeshim, what is Kodesh Kodeshim according to Rav Kook? Exactly. There's Kodesh, Chol, and Kodesh Kodeshim, which is what? It includes both. It's not both. It's much higher than both. Mm -hmm. Right? You can't say the coin is both the head and the tail. It's a coin. Right? Mark Twain once said that sometimes it's not that you made a bad choice. It's that you had bad imagination. Mm -hmm. There was a third choice you didn't even think of. Mm -hmm. So we haven't been thinking of the third choice. The third choice is really love. But we, we failed at love. Miserably failed at love. Because in so many relationships, love is about she has to be subordinate to me. He has to be subordinate to me. I have to give up myself so we can be we. She has to give up herself so we can be we. Right. How is it possible that two very different people could share a single identity? You know? That's why there's a, there's a midrash that says that if, there, if people don't have shalom between them in their marriage, then even if their bed is as wide as the universe, it will not be big enough. Because they don't have shalom between them. But a couple that has shalom between them, even if their bed is the edge of a razor, they'll be able to sleep there. Probably won't be very comfortable. <laughs> but then again, people lie on beds of nails, so I don't know. But um, that's the amazing thing. You transcend time. You transcend space. That's what happened to the base of Migdash. When they said the name of Hashem in the Kodesh Kodeshim, suddenly everybody that was packed in there, like sardines, there was no space for all of us. We were just packed in. We were all kind of pretty cramped in. Suddenly everybody would bow and have plenty of space around them. We transcended the limitations of time and space. See, it's space that's saying, you're over there and I'm over here and we are separate. It's time that's saying, we're in this time and Alfred Avino and Sara was years ago. We're not connected. It's a lie. It's not true. Uh, as Einstein said, time and space is a mode of thinking and it's an illusion. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, it's a practical way of thinking, but it's an illusion. Uh, reality transcends time and space. But our brain is operating from a place of time and space. So either it's now or later. Either it's here or there. But is it possible it's beyond the either or? Uh, so let's just go back to Rabbi Nachman. So Rabbi Nachman is saying that through a munah that transcends Chakira and Chochma, again, he's not using Chochma in the way that we were. So based on that, is Hashem in the world or Hashem beyond the world? Well, Cain, Yisrael, Nikrim, Ivrim. And that's why Jews are called Ivrim. What does that mean? Al Shem Shehem Ovrim, Vemunatam Al Kol Chachmat. We're called Ivrim because we transcend, we bypass, we're over. Right? We pass over, right, uh, with our Emuna Chachmat. We get to a, a knowing. That's much greater than Chachma. That's why God is referred to as the God of the Ivrim. Right? Miloshen Ever Hanar, which is Lashen Stadim. Ever Hanar means which side of the river are you? Are you on this side of the river or that side of the river? And Jews can't decide. <laughs> we love Machlokis. That's what's amazing about Jewish tradition. There is no other tradition in the world that holds in such high esteem a focus. See, people think, you know, what are you doing all day? You're learning Gemara? You're learning how people argue, right? Well, what is that? Right? That is our holy place of greater consciousness. 
right? So if I took a guy who came from the east and said, show me your holy places. And, you know, right this next door to Yeshiva Koto. So I take him to Yeshiva Koto that has more guys than we do, right? I mean, not better guys. I'm just joking, right? <laughs> more guys than we do, right? And he goes in there and just sees people screaming at each other. But he just came from a temple where they sit in silence, right? And now he's looking for a place of higher Jewish consciousness where we are engaged in the yearning for God and we're arguing, screaming. And if you go in there, you see people banging on the table and waving their hands, you know, and you're just like, what's going on? Right? Well, if you stay, you'll see that these chavruses will, you know, hug each other and go get some lunch. That's your search for God? Yeah. The search for God is search for truth. And the search for truth is to realize there's always two sides, because it's a coin. It's not heads or tails. It's a coin. Right. And so that's the path of the Jewish people. Look at number 11. Va'am Yisrael goya chad The Jewish people are a oneity goy. We are people that are committed to echad. Right. We're not just unified. We're a goy echad. That's our motto. Right? My motto on my website is called Living the Power of the One. That's what we do. We live the power of the one. Uh, we hate duality from our very soul. It's mamish in our very kishkos. We can't stand duality. We're always looking. That's why Jews, they're so argumentative. You know, two Jews, three opinions, right? Because we know that there is this higher truth. That's the idea of Shalom Aleichem Friday night. Why do you say Shalom Aleichem three times? Right? The first time is the left, the second time is the right, the third time is the center. Is the center left or right? It's beyond the either or. Right? That's why you'll see Bretzlev, one of the ways of Hamtakas Adinim, the way one sweetens judgment in the world is they clap their hands, Right? I remember the first time I was at the cocktail, I was davening, right? and I bowed, and they started clapping. What did I do? <laughs> but when they daven, you'll see them clapping like this. So, according to Bretzlev, when you clap, you're causing a sweetening of judgment. So what does judgment do? Gzer din cuts things into pieces, and gezer din is, this is not that, that's not this, this is the lacha, that's not the lacha. Hamtak is the dinim, to sweeten the judgment is to put it back into its root, right? And this is doing that. Is this the sound of my right hand, or is this the sound of my left hand? This is just beyond the either or. So that sound takes you where Emmis is. Where Emmis is. So Rav Cook says, we, 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 don't, we just can't stand Shniut. Mm. Right? And I remember when I was in Toronto, I'm from Toronto. Anybody from Toronto? Any Canadians? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. Um, so uh, I was in the library uh, by uh, Young and Finch, there's a library over there. So I went to, you know, I, guess I went to the philosophy section. And I found a book that you could call the Shita Mikubetsit of, 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 of philosophy. Which is, you know, Shita Mukupetsit is like, this is the book that just kind of records all the different opinions together. Mm -hmm. right? And so I picked it up, like, interesting, you know, and it, and, and, and it would have all these classic, you know, philosophical questions. Is life free choice or determined? And they'd have all the Shitas that say it's free choice. And they have all the Shitas that would say determined. Okay. Is reality mind or matter? Then they would have all the shitas that would say it's matter, and all the shitas that would say it was mind. Right? And they would ask, is reality spiritual or material? And they give it all, is it body or soul? And they give it all. And you know what? We say, yes, and we close the book. <laughs> What's the point of that? It, it's, you know, is, is all determined? I call it safui. But do we have free choice? But I should the two now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's beyond the either or. You can't understand it? Okay, you're stuck in your mitzun mind. 
But, but don't put Hashem into that. Hashem can have both determinism and free choice at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the difference in Jews. You know, when they talk about the Judeo-Christian tradition, there is no such thing. There is no such thing. You know, I mentioned the other day, uh, Buber was asked, you know, uh, you know, actually, Buber said, the difference between the Jewish people and Christianity is that they believe that the Messiah has come, and we believe that the Messiah has not yet come. He said, I suggest that we just wait. Like, why argue over this? We'll wait. When Messiah comes, we'll ask him, were you here before? <laughs> and he said, what I would suggest, if Messiah asks me my opinion, I would suggest he answer, oh gee, I don't remember. You know? <laughs> Keep the faith. You know? Keep the peace. Anyways, that's not true. The difference between the Jewish people and Christianity is not whether the Messiah came or not. The difference is so different because they are stuck in a dualistic mind. Right? Because in their world, the physical and the spiritual are enemies of each other. Right? And if you're going to be a holy person, you know, you have to remove yourself from this world. Right? And that is very, you know, that is so not Jewish. You know, in, 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 our, in, in our tradition, you know, the holy person aspires to be married, to have children. Okay? But for them, the priest doesn't get married. Because he doesn't engage in that physical, you know. I remember I was, um, I was walking with my, my daughter. She was, a little, she was a little girl at the time. And she saw a bunch of nuns. And she said, oh, well, look, brides. <laughs> and she said they were all brides. She couldn't understand why there were so many brides and why it was black. Right? I said, well, actually, no, they're not brides. I said, actually, they are. <laughs> they, they're, they're married to, to Yoshka. You know what I mean? So, um, that's just not our tradition. We, we don't dislike Olam Hazeh. And our goal is not to get out of Olam Hazeh as soon as possible. Right? And that the true, true Olam Abba will include both the best of both worlds. That will be, that is where we'll go. Okay. And so, um, so the last thing over here, he says, uh, We just can't stand Shniut. That is idolatry. Because idolatry is saying there's this God and there's that God and they will forever fight with each other or one's going to win the other. Somebody's got to win. And uh, that really, Avodah Zorah, by definition, is dualistic thinking, whereby this cannot include that. Okay? And that's why I say, Tarte de Satre, they are mutually contradictory. Who must The conclusion of narrow logic is that there are two contradictory positions. Just like in this picture over here. Right? Is this a picture of a white goblet? Or is this a picture of two people looking at each other? Or is this a picture of Hello Kitty? <laughs> you do see the Hello Kitty. No. Okay, no, it's not. Okay, so these, so how many of you guys see the two faces? Okay, how many people here see the white goblet? Okay, but you really can't see the both at the very same time. Your mind will oscillate very quickly because we are still under the influence of classical logic when in fact Torah and the Chachma de Kodesh, uh, the holy logic, is to learn to, through enjoying <coughs> Machlokis, exercising ourselves in Machlokis, which is what, you know, Talmudic thinking is. It's called divergent logic. I get inside of this rabbi's head. How does he see it? And then I get inside of this rabbi's head. How does he see it? And what you're doing is you're being able to kind of get inside different perspectives and transcend the either or while including that. Okay? And therefore, what most people don't understand is the study of Torah text is a spiritual practice. Okay? It's an exercise of training our minds towards more and more Chachma Kodesh. Yeah. Um, Does everyone know who you are? Have you all introduced each other? JJ. Yeah. <laughs> um, how, how do we reconcile? Um, so thank you for coming to speak, bud. Um, oh, thank you for coming to hear me. <laughs> um, how do we reconcile um, trying to 
you know, convey our opinion and muffle look at it, but also valuing like the need for the other side to be there. Like, because if we if we argue and we get the entire side on our side, is that necessarily a good thing? Should we not try to convince everybody? You should, because that's your job. Your job is you are heads, and your job is if right now practically heads is what needs to happen. Practically, we can't do two opposite things at the same time, right? You're not going to have black and white at the same time. Right now, you can't. Okay. So, um, but Rav Kook has a very beautiful teaching. You know, we all have this idea called Dan le Kafskut. Dan le Kafskut means, you know, uh, give the person the benefit of the doubt. That's how it's been translated. Rav Kook says it's actually much deeper than that. Rav Kook says Dan le Kafskut means try to find the schut, try to find the merit in the other person's thinking. Because from that place you could talk to them. But if you give off this vibe that what they're saying is absolutely stupid, there's no way they could hear what you have to say. Right? So by, by quoting them first and saying, look, it, what I hear from you is ba da 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 And I can see some truth in that also. However, I think right now, ba da 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 but when you're discussing something, you want to try and find merit in their position. Okay? Because otherwise you're not having a dialogue at all. Right? So you have to try and understand, you know, where they're coming from. You know? Like uh, recently there was an issue in yeshiva between uh, some roommates, and uh, you know, everybody just took the side of the, the two other roommates. Well that's not fair. Right? Maybe this guy has a very valid point that he's struggling with, right? And if they could hear his valid point, maybe then they could come to uh, a win-win situation, which is a third option. Right? Maybe there's a third option where we could include both. Maybe. Uh, we should always try and find the win-win. Okay. That is the challenge in a loving relationship. You see, I think a lot of loving relationships die not because there's not enough romance. I think because there's not enough intelligence. Right? They're not being intelligent. And um, because they, they don't, they're not able to see each other's side. They're not able to hear that there is going to be another side. And, and that's their side. But just, just don't just invalidate it completely. As, as the Gemara says, that even Shekhar must have a spark of MS. Otherwise it would have no existence whatsoever. So when you're hearing something that is Shekhar, it can't be a million percent Shekhar, because it wouldn't be in the world if it was a million percent Shekhar. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some kernel, some, some spark of truth there that's keeping it alive. Right? Now they have taken the spark and they think it's the whole story. Okay, but if you find that spark and point it out to them, it'll be much easier to release them from their Shekhar because they're holding on to their Shekhar because of this little spark that they haven't been able to identify as just a spark. I think it's the whole, the whole truth. Here's just a quick follow-up. Um, wouldn't that also mean that um, if like, we're saying like, there must be another side of the argument, then wouldn't that mean that there's another argument that says that there isn't another side of the argument? Mm -hmm. Right. And those are the people that are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there's always another side. As it says, there was 49 reasons for it to be tame. 49 reasons for Bitoma. In the world of Emes, it transcends our either or. But in the world that we're in, the world of Tzimtzum, now, it's all of the Shir, why are we under the influence of Tzimtzum? Why did Hashem bring us into the world where that which was pure oneity is now being manifest as diversity and conflict? There's a reason for that. Huh? Yeah. Um, the principle of Elu Elu relies on a premise that like someone like Beit Hillel and Shammai are posting over the ages sort of have like a complete overview of like halacha and of the, the nuances of perspectives. If Eilu Eilu is like taken in day-to-day -day life and like the modern world, can you just say that it will turn into an excuse for relative morality? That's why uh, this kind of thinking was not a prevalent thinking in the Jewish world. In other words, you have to start off being a classical thinker. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll be this wishy-washy, tolerant person and say, well, 
There's always another side, so it doesn't matter. Right? That's already dangerous, because we need you to present with incredible passion tales. But if you're already with this assumption, well, there's obviously a position to heads. So that will diminish your passion to presenting tales. Your job is to be tales. His job is to be heads. But when people get into this wishy-washy kind of tolerance, well, there's always another side. And it all transcends all this anyways. That's why this is a very dangerous way of thinking. Right? But nonetheless, at a certain point in history, it's a very dangerous way not to think. Right? So there's a reason why, for practical reasons, that we are wired with classical logic. And there's reasons why now, in only the last couple hundred years, that quantum logic is emerging because Mashiach is coming. Right? And Olam Abbat is around the corner. You know? So there's timing to even the way we think. And there's a reason why, Rav Cook says, there's a reason why the world needed to believe that the world was flat. Because if you would have introduced to the world prematurely that the world was round, people would freak out. <laughs> wouldn't know what to do with that, you know? You know, there's a reason why we are not aware of the fact that at this very moment we are spinning at an incredible velocity and nobody's holding on to their kippahs or their shaitos, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, no, you know, like, but right now, reality-wise, the earth is spinning at an incredible velocity. But we're not feeling that. So it just goes to show that Emmas has a timing when it can be revealed to someone. Because it's something you need to know before you know that Emmas. Just like we talked about in the we need to be monotheists before the truth of Judaism becomes really manifest. Because monotheism certain establishes a certain thing. So the fact that people were arguing was a healthy thing. Because it, de it developed the position of tales. Right? And if we would have prematurely told Tails, hey, listen, you know there's a heads and he's just as valid as you, then Tails would have said, oh, no. And he wouldn't have presented his argument in a compelling way. He wouldn't even develop and sharpen his argument. So that's why it's important to still be a classical logical mind, while taking already a little more into consideration that when you're talking to somebody, you have to dunk up school and try and find where is their emiss in what they're saying. Right? And if you, can, if you can acknowledge the emiss that they're saying, you have a greater chance of them retracting from the sheker that they're, 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 they're trapped in. Mm -hmm. Anyways, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, think, uh, for listening. As well as if you're interested in getting more of this kind of stuff. So uh, first of all, I have a weekly um, mailing uh, from my website called rabbidavidaron.com, which is... Uh, David Aaron is A A R O N dot com. And if you want, you can just on your cell phone just scroll down to the end of when you get to the website. You can just um, submit your name, and then I send out every week uh, an article, a podcast. I have a radio show called Soul Talk that I put out. I have animations that I do. Uh, so if you want to hear more of this kind of Torah, then you can get it delivered to your phone uh, weekly. Uh, other than that, I'm very active on Facebook. I post almost every day. So if you go to either David Aaron, my personal Facebook, or Rabbi David Aaron, uh, so I put up uh, stuff there every single day. It's the same stuff that goes out weekly. It's just uh, goes out daily, different pieces of it. Uh, that's it. I've written eight books. I didn't bring any with me today, but uh, you can uh, check them out. Uh, the book that would most correlate to what I share today is a book called The Secret Life of God. Uh, but again, the book is a lot more than that, and it doesn't actually directly talk about this. It doesn't mention this at all, but you you'll understand it better now that you understand it. Did you ever record the lecture of this particular? We just did. <laughs> oh, nice. Just did. Actually, I was just thinking about it. I should have brought my recorder, uh, but you'll you send me a copy of that? Uh, yeah. It, it actually, uh, I do have a three-part series recorded that I gave to rabbis. Uh, uh, called One Is Not One. It's on the website now? No, because it's an, an advanced oh, it's group of people, so I didn't put it on out. But if you send me an email, any of you send me an email, I, I think after you've heard this class you could follow it. So I would, uh, I would let you get an access to his link. All right. So my email is rda 
I'm with David Aaron at Israelite.org. I S R A L I G H T dot org. No E. Israelite. Is that the it's at the top of here? So, uh, so I have a three-part series called One is Not Done. Yeah. Um, is it possible to transcend dualistic thinking while still being in Olam Hazeh? Sure, I think they call it DMT. <laughs> I think that's what they call it. Deep <laughs> Ray. Uh, yes, when people take drugs, what they're essentially doing is they're trying to bypass their, their brain because the brain is producing a chemical that is filtering out reality as it really is. And some say that the brain is doing more filtering than receiving. And that the claim is that some of the drugs that have been called hallucinative are not hallucinative, but actually are diminishing or cutting out some, if not all, of this chemical and allowing your brain to see reality as it is. So you would then wonder, well, why not just take that drug, right? I actually have it on sale. I know, I'm just joking. <laughs> just joking. The reason why you don't take that drug is because you're just burning a big hole in your brain because you're not ready for this kind of thinking, okay? So it's like a person that wants to get to the top of the Empire State Building and they don't want to take the elevator or, the, uh, or walk the stairs. They're climbing, you know, the wall outside. You don't do that. You know, you, when, when you're ready for that way of thinking, you know, through learning Torah and doing mitzvahs, but essentially when we live a Torah life, we are, we are fusing ourselves with Chachma Kodesh, because that's where Torah came from. Torah is the manifestation of holy wisdom, non-dual wisdom. So the more we ingest that wisdom, the more we prepare ourselves for it when we leave this world uh, and we pass out of this world. But, uh, but what people are doing on the drug uh, journey is they just don't have patience. And you will, you will you know, if you, if, you, if you listen to people's witness, uh, you know, testimonies of their drug experiences, they will describe, you know, the death of ego and, you know, they will describe paradoxical things that they're experiencing. Uh, but again, that's wrong to be doing because you're not ready for it. And... That's actually one of the teachings that, um, that Adam and Eve, um, they separated the tree of knowledge from the, of good and bad from the truth. And that was part of this problem, right, where good and bad have been separated from emis. Emis is non-dual. Good and bad is dual, right? And um, so it, had they eaten it together, that would have been okay, according to one capitalistic position. Uh, but they separated them. And, uh, but according to the Talmidei Harizal, Hashem was going to give it to them anyways on Shabbos. Mm -hmm. right? That's what Shabbos is. Shabbos is a taste of Olam Haba. It's a taste of the non-dual. Because Shabbos is not a day of spirituality. It's not a day of physicality. It's a holy day where both the physical and the spiritual are two sides of this holy experience. And um, it's me'ein olam haba. Why is it not me'ayin? Me'eine olam haba. Why is it not from the eyes of olam haba? Why is it from the eye? One eye. It might be hinting to what in the East is referred to as the third eye. Right? And it could be that when people do this, when they, put, when they say the Shema, what you're doing is you're putting your finger on the third eye. Right? Again, we don't so much have an idea of the third eye. We have something called the forehead, which in Kabbalah, the highest consciousness will come from the forehead, which transcends the duality of the two eyes, the two ears, the two nostrils, the two lips. Right? That is, our senses are, are dualistic, but the forehead, you know, is a way of knowing truth beyond the dual. So according to Kabbalah, the final uh, redemptive times will be a light that will emanate from the forehead. Right? And that's why, according to Kabbalah, uh, when you're making Kiddush Friday night, most likely this is its meaning, is you're supposed to look at, you know, you hold the cup, and you're supposed to see the reflection of your forehead in the wine. Okay? Now, just a secret trick of the trade, red wine. Won't work with white wine. Uh, uh, but, uh, unless you have a red face. But if you have a, you know, but white, 
red wine, and you see your forehead, because uh, Shabbos is a little more connected to learning and knowing through your forehead, and not through your dualistic senses. I don't know how much time we have. Yeah, what's your name? Aliza. Yeah. Um, so do you think that our goal in like an Olam Haba type of world, or even like the best world that we can give to ourselves now, is to have Similar to what we have now, like so many different types of people, like we have Hasidic and like conservative people, and like every type of type, like on the spectrum. But would you say that we want our our goal is to have that, just to have greater respect for one another, or is our goal to be so like not consumed with the duality that we don't even we don't even like identify as a Hasid or as a as a reformed Jew? Or no, that wouldn't like be non-duality. That would be homogenized reality. That would be trying to jump into an undifferentiated reality. No, it goes back to true love. True love is neither one of us is, feels that we need to compromise our uniqueness. In fact, for the sake of the marriage, right, tails has to be tails. It can't say, you know what, to be together I gotta be a little bit more like heads. Heads say, you know what, and I, we can't stay together unless I am a little bit more taily. You know, no, right? What unites us is what, in most people's uh, thinking, is divides us, mm. right? Because we are two sides of one coin, and, and I need you to be heads, and you need me to be tails, right? So there is not going to be a compromise in the, in the uniqueness of colors. There'll just be a deep understanding that white is a part of black while remaining purely white. And, and black is a part of white while remaining purely, you know, black. And we're not going to compromise. Compromise is not true love and true peace. Uh, we won't be shut in. So, so, you know, that's why uh, I heard a beautiful teaching from the Belzer Rebbe when they inaugurated the Belzer Hasidim uh, uh, building that the Rebbe said, find a Rebbe that's like one of the ministering angels of Hashem. So Rebbe says, where are you going to find a, 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 a Rebbe that's one of the ministering angels of God? Say it's Sadiq. But, you know, you're not going to find an angel. So the Rebbe says, no, find a Rebbe who's like one of God's angels. They don't compromise their mission. Right? Gabriel has a mission very different than Raphael. But they know that there are other angels. Right? They don't invalidate the other angels that we all have to be Gavriels. Right? And that is, you know, that is kind of my position. I personally wear a black knitted kippa because uh, it's my non-dual kippa. You know, are you black? Are you yeshivish? Or are you, you know, tzioini? You know, which one are you? Oh, uh, I, I would like to include the two, you know. Uh, my next move is to get a, a black knitted hat, but I, I'm, working on, I'm working on that. So, um, but, uh, but nonetheless, nobody wants you in, to, to not, you just, you know, just enjoy. A Brett's lover is a Brett's lover. And that's okay. As long as he doesn't go around saying that everybody has to be Brett's lover, and all of Chabad is wrong, or whatever. That's like, no. It's Chabad. But, and that's very beautiful. Yeah. Rav Cook says that we're in a generation, though, that's becoming more Klali, where people want to be able to draw from a diverse places. So now you've got this Chabakuk kind of thing, where you've got, you know, uh, Dati Lumi kids that are really into Chabad, and yet they're not Chabad. So we're going to see more and more of that. But nonetheless, you know, we don't want Tails to give up its identity. Four heads.